On January 3rd, 2024, Cat Williams would prove once again why he's considered a living legend after an interview was released with Shannon Sharp on the Club Shay Shay podcast. Williams will open up about his career and life, but to everyone's liking, his perspective on the comedy game and beats he had with fellow comedians. In 2005, Nick Cannon would present sketch comedy improv show while Out on MTV. The show would feature a lineup of stand-up comedians like D. Ray Davis, Corey Holcomb, Afion Crockett, Cat Williams, and my next interview, Spanky Hayes. In the spirit of Williams' conversation with Sharp that has received over 45 million views, we would speak with Hayes to share some of the backstories and comedy that he has experienced firsthand. And of course, his thoughts on his fellow Wild and Out co-star, Cat Williams, taking aim at the industry. Mr. Spanky Hayes, welcome back to Comedy Hype. How have you been? Like, new year, man. What's going on with you? How's it going, man? Hey, I'm doing great, man. Doing well. Kids are well, wife is well, life is well, God is great. Right. I've always loved that, uh, I would say, that transition from, like, this rock star comedian, and I'm sure you still are, but to also a family man, to see that. That's, that's been dope from my vantage point to see it. But let's talk about comedy, man. I'm not going to even hold people. What's going on? One, your brethren or your comedy comrade, Mr. Cat Williams, let off a bomb last week. A nuclear missile. What was your What was your reaction when you when you saw this interview? Did you watch it? How much of it did you see? Because it is very long. But what was your reaction to to seeing Cat get off those shots? Well, first of all, I watched it about ten times out of just to make sure I'm receiving it well. And mm -hmm. um, I I think that uh. Cat is telling his truth. Everybody got a truth. It's, it's the lie, and then it's the truth, and then it's your truth that's in the middle. So I think he, he he was telling his truth, but it was a lot of it was really true. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think I think what he said, nothing is wrong with what he said. His personal life, you know, when him being younger, of course I didn't know mm -hmm. him then. So I don't know what he did when he was younger. I don't know how many books he read. Everybody keep right, right. People keep talking about that. Yeah, right, right. right. People that. keep didn't, talking about that. Yeah, yeah he keep, he didn't read three thousand books. What kind of books did he read? Doctor Seuss books? I don't know what he read. Yeah, uh, but I will say that Cat Williams is a very intelligent, generous guy, and uh, yeah. unfortunately, when you're very generous, you have a side to you. Almost like the Joker. Like, he's almost like the Joker. He's like, mm. like a, a good person. And he'll look out for you. And he'll take you on the road with him. He'll do all anything you need. But then if one person piss him off, he is pissed. Right. So it's, 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 it's like 10 versions of Cat. Like, three of them are cool. The other seven, wow. <laughs> that's a good way to that's a good way to put it because you know we've been able to cover cat many stories of cat they haven't always been like this you know this savior it's always been kind of like cat on his rock star tip cat doing some wild and out but then he might go help an old lady across the street and so they didn't have a you fight know, when they get over there exactly like cat you just don't ever know but i also think that's why what makes him such a dynamic figure is that you don't never know what you're gonna get from him now let's talk about this interview let's dissect it because you know spanky you came up with cat in the earlier part of his career with wild and out um for those that should know this and there's also people that he's talking about that i know that you've worked with too the first and the biggest one that we've covered so many times is cat versus kevin hart okay from your vantage point did you notice any tension back then when they, when I think Kevin did pop up on Wildin' Out a couple of times and actually did a, a skit called Judge Mo Dallas, um, where Kat is the judge and Kevin ended up being a part of the skit. And from the looks of it and what I've heard, you know, they had some chemistry there. From your vantage point, what started this beef between Kat and Kevin Hart? I think the struggle. I think, okay, so let me, let me, let me uh, put this on you. When in in those days, I want to say around 2000, let's go like 2000, let's go 2000, 2001. Uh, Kevin Hart just appeared in LA all of a sudden. We all kind of knew him, but we didn't mm -hmm. like know him. And then all of a sudden, this motherfucker had two TV shows in a in a movie. 
Like, right. who, how did that happen? Like, we all, Kevin Hart is such a mystery in Black comedy to, to Black comedians because we don't know how he came up. Like, he just came to L.A. and then he was just, he was the nigga. Like, right. like how did that happen? Like, I'm sleeping on the couch. Where, where you sleep at? And this motherfucker came in staying on sunset i remember when him and tori first came to la like uh they were a couple then and um i just didn't get it I, I never thought that he would be as big as he is because i never thought he was funny like that now mm -hmm. he's a good person he's a <clears throat> genuine person but most people are genuine when they're winning in a game that they're supposed to be losing in so i never felt his genuineness now, I will mm -hmm. say this. When I first met Kevin Hart, he used to give me shoes because he had like a Nike uh, deal or something. Deal he or would something, be like, yeah. yo, you wear the same size as me. Come to my crib. I gave you, he gave me boxes of shoes before, like brand new shoes. So I didn't always dislike Kevin Hart. I just started disliking him when he would start walking around acting like he did. And we all like, but, but where did this come from? Yeah, I think um, so. So. So one, I would love for you to answer this. Did you notice any issues with them back then? And do you think, so you're pretty much confirming that Kat's feeling is that this guy came out of nowhere and he started having an air about himself is what you think sparked his issues with Kevin, to be clear. There was only a, a few people that were, uh, I guess we could say nominated for the next big thing and then here comes this person that nobody know and, and he's the guy right. like what right. like who is this so i think more people that know kevin hart we all wanted to get to know him because but how we was he know where he came from how, how was he during the wild and out time when like i said when he first kind of came around y'all what did he have that air about himself then or was it more like happy to be here um because did y'all have issues then like i'm just trying to figure out the timeline of this I, I think we did because, okay, so let me put you right here. So when Kevin came to Wild and Out, first of all, Kevin was on the first episode of Wild and Out. Yeah. Every, every year we did a new season, he would be the first show. I don't know why. See, that, that's that question again. Why is he the first one every time? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, at that time, Soul Plane was bootleg. It was all over L.A., so that didn't chime out. Uh, his two sitcoms didn't touch the air like that. So by the time he came to Wild and Out, that was like a savior for him, for for Kevin. But of course, mm -hmm. we don't we don't know that at the time because we all trying to work and we all you know trying to be ha ha kiki. But nobody liked each other at that time because we we all trying to be the breakout star. Me, Atheon, Kevin, uh, Cat Cat didn't come to later. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, uh, this the core group of the Wild and Out. Uh, Nick, I would say, well, Nick, well, well, let me take that back. Cat was in the first episodes, mm -hmm. but he wasn't. He wasn't the man. But I remember this though. I remember Nick coming out, introducing everybody, like the first time that we are taping Wild and Out. And mm -hmm. when he got to Cat, he said, "And Cat Williams," and the whole audience is like blew up. And I looked at Afion and said. Why did that happen? And then he said, that's Money Mike. And I was like, Got you. right. He is Money Mike. So it hit. So the movie hit while filming. Wild well, the out. movie was already out. The movie was already out by the time Wild okay. and Out started. So he, but he was already Money Mike, basically. So he Got already you. had a jump on everybody in the cast Got you. Got because you. he was already Money Mike. And now, he was coming out throwing thousands of dollars in the audience. Like he already had money, but it's safe to say Cat was this Cat and Nick were the only two that had money at this time. And and Nick is, you know, he's so conservative, he's not gonna throw no money out like that. But Cat was buying niggas gym shoes and outfits and yeah, yeah. Cat, shout out to Cat, man. Cat always been solid to me, man. He always been solid. He's always that scariness about him, but he always been solid though. Now he was Smith, solid, nigga. That don't hurt. That don't hurt you. The way that he acts and he might change. If you solid, that don't hurt. That don't affect you. It only mm -hmm. affects sucker niggas. Understood. Now, Spanky, you mentioned um, Kevin's rise and his mysterious rise. Now, 
I am a comedy fan, so from the outside looking in, I felt that I was aware with Kevin because of the age of World Star. That's when I first got familiar with him. So it makes me think maybe for you guys that, remember how social media wasn't really a thing for comedians at a point? It was still like the, the you know, go to comedy clubs, club hopping. But Kevin, I think, saw a lane and an opportunity to start kind of putting content out there. I remember there was a video with him working out in the gym and he it was like he was being funny about lifting weights. And I remember seeing this and I wasn't tapped into him on a stand-up tip, but in World Star and seeing funny videos, I remember him from that moment. And I'm wondering, maybe that's what happened. He was maybe the first the first social media comedian in a sense and you guys weren't aware maybe of of what was going on here but the executives and people in power kind of like scouring the internet and they're seeing him constantly putting out content meanwhile you're like at the club at the comedy store or you're at the improv and he's nowhere to be found but he's building his uh his audience up online maybe that's what maybe happened I think, you know what? And that's a great point, John, because I've never looked at it in that sense because Wild and Out was a little bit before social media. Like, like mm-hmm. I remember hanging out with Tom from MySpace uh, on the set of Wild and Out. You know okay. what I mean? So, so we were like there, but by the time Facebook came out, we weren't, it was, the show wasn't as popular. So we kind of missed that. And then we kind of picked back up when Instagram came out. I remember being on the set and Instagram was new and we all trying to follow each other and we all trying to, so right. we we were kind of neck and neck with, with social media. So, so yeah. a lot of us didn't carry over because we felt we were stars and we felt we didn't have to do this because this is for little kids. These for little niggas. Right. So we ain't got to do that. We already on TV. So even me, I, I kind of missed a lot of boats, not jumping on social media as soon as it came out because I was already kind of in my ways and stubborn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, man, I'm not doing, I already got to be on the set 11 hours a day. I don't got time to shoot no, no skits and shit like that. But, yeah. you know, and that was before YouTube. There's a, there's, you know, there's a whole conversation about what happened to Blockbuster versus Netflix. You know, Blockbuster had stuck in their ways. Hey, we already got our database of clients and customers. And Netflix was still thinking about in ways to innovate with the Internet. And we saw what happened in that. And I think that's happening now in today's time, because if you look at Wild and Out, majority of the people that they have on there have social media followings. It seems like it might be a criteria that it's like, hey, what is your following before we have you on here? Um, because it makes sense. It's marketing, right? It's it's able to keep the platform, or excuse me, keep the show relevant and get it out there. So um, I understand the business part of that. Yeah. Social media actually took away the real actor and, mm-hmm. and on a while and out uh, tip because they went from, again, me, Afion, Mikey Day, et cetera, Corey Holcomb, D-Ray, to uh, Funny Mike. And I don't know if it's a Funny Mike. I'm just throwing a name out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, J.J. Icefish. That's when I quit. I was like, yo, y'all got J.J. Icefish on it? I quit. I quit. Y'all don't take this seriously. They have to, they got, they're trying to sell a show. They trying to, <laughs> but I, but I think is your issue is you don't feel like Wild Now needed that. I, I really didn't because I felt like if he would have stuck with the core, the, the, the core of, of the, the, the group, we would be major, major stars right now. That, I mean, that's just how I feel. If we, if we would have went on tour at that time, it would have made, it would have made more sense. Uh, instead yeah. of getting a man, and, not, and ain't nothing wrong with these brothers and sisters. It's just that at the time, I just didn't accept them because I felt like they shouldn't be on stage with me. Like, man, you do shit in, at your house for thirty minutes, thirty seconds. Like, you. Right. Know, I remember uh, Tim Leggetto. Shout out to Tim Leggetto. I remember his first day, and he's looking in the camera the whole time, following the camera. And we like, hey, hey, cut! Don't look in the camera. Oh, I'm just used to doing this in my garage. So what, motherfucker? This is a real show now. Like you can't. So yeah. it was like, it was like we had to, and especially for me, like Chico, uh, Carlos, uh, Emmanuel, uh, and all them, them guys. I had to train them. So imagine <laughs> hating a motherfucker. <laughs> you got to train them. You t- to replace you. 
Yeah. That happens in corporate America a lot, though, too. So. It does. It does. But in comedy, <laughs> so. you, you, we, we, don't, we don't really put that together. But I get it. I get it now yeah. as a grown man. Yeah. I get it. But at the yeah. time, I was like, so, Nick, so what you doing, man? You, you making me train these niggas? So, because you know I'm going to quit? He's like, well, we got to get everything we can out of you, bro. I'm like, mm. at the time, I'm like, huh? But I get it. So you guys were, you and Nick were able to have a conversation about you exiting. Because you, uh, you would tell us about partially of the reason why you left is because the pay rate changed when you first started. I could, I could see how that impacted. But is there other reasons why? And what was your conversation to Nick to kind of like, you know, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to have to move on. Well, it was it was the pay cut, and it was more jobs. See, I had more jobs and less mm -hmm. money because when we went to MTV2, they didn't know the show. They didn't know how to shoot the show. They didn't know how to. So we had to teach them. Basically, me, I, I was one of the main ones. I had to teach them, okay, shoot it this way. Okay, I had to teach the cast, hey, man, don't look in the camera. Don't do this. Don't go out too many times. They hate that. Like, I had to train them and then i left after that so the reason the, my final leaving i remember it was my birthday and we were in new york it was cold it was really cold and um uh uh what's my guy's name uh rest in peace uh uh chris chris farley chris farley's brother was our uh, uh how you say uh not mentor but he was Warm teaching up. us other improv okay. stuff he was teaching okay. us newer ways to do stuff so his birthday was the day after mine, and I remember them not buying me a cake, but then they bought him a cake. And that kind of like struck a nerve. And then I remember Corey Holcomb, God bless Corey Holcomb. Uh, he said, man, that ain't right. Y'all got him a cake and ain't get Spanky cake, Spanky birthday. So I felt like it wasn't just me like, okay, Corey, you see it too, huh? So it's like, so I, I wouldn't say that I, I did quit, but I would say they mostly Push me to quit. Got you. You feel like they was kind of planning, got you, they were trying to plan to phase you out. And it kind of like, you start noticing little stuff. Okay, you're not, you're not, you know, noticing my birthday. You might have done it before. You know, you kind of like, I could see that from, um, again, from that business angle of them thinking that um, they could probably get cheaper talent. And at the same time, the cheaper talent can maybe create more noise as far as social media as that was increasing. Exactly. Um, exactly. And yeah. then they probably and, could get somebody with not so much of an opinion like I had. Because right. I've been there from the beginning, right. day one, day zero. So I knew how to right. do everything. How did Nick take how did Nick take that? Did you guys cause you guys have um, from what I can tell, and even your own words, it seemed like you guys had or have a really like personal relationship. This is supposed to be business, but you know sometimes you do build connections with people beyond business. But how did he take that when you guys split apart? Was it personal? Was it do your thing? What, did he give you a blessing? Like what was that exchange like? That's a good question because I don't know because he kind of just. Let it, he kind of like washed his hands of it. Like I could tell he was, cause he got tired of me complaining. Then I started doing Bobby Brown type shit. So, you know, they would be like, oh, Spanky is too wild. But he would be like, man, you can't get rid of Spanky cause Spanky knows the whole blueprint. So you can't, until we make another blueprint, you can't get rid of Spanky. So I, I know right. he had my back a lot of times, but I think right. eventually he had to wash his hands of it because every day it was a new problem. Every day it was a new problem. And a lot of times I was creating a problem because I hated it. I didn't want to do it no more. And then and then it was around the time where we were doing stand-ups. I don't know if you remember that. Like it was a, a couple of seasons or maybe one or maybe two seasons. I remember that. Where, yeah, yeah, where they would do yeah. stand-up stuff. So my yeah. stand-up never came out because mm. I was going, talking about Nick. I was talking about the cast. I was talking about homosexuals. I was talking about everybody else set was like uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. My shit so was like spanky. House, So bro. from my vantage point, right, because we're cool, but in my mind, I was like, why would, you do, why would you do material against Nick? Because I, I don't think... There's probably a lot of truth attached to your jokes 
and it's gonna sting a bit. Why did you decide to be this rebel in that in that standpoint of like, yo, I'm finna just like let it, let y'all have it. These are your employers. A lot of people don't try to come at the employers, but <laughs> what's what's going on? But because he gave me a boss position, and I kind of put on two big shoes, I guess at the time. Yeah, and um, I just uh. I just didn't care, man. I didn't care no more because I, yeah. I everything that I was complaining about never got fixed. Like it would always be, okay, man, I'll try to take care of that. But can you do this for me? Damn, I'm that's what we talk about right now. Right. So I just felt like I was just so unappreciated. I had gave my whole life up for this. My whole yeah. 20s I gave for this. And I just feel like I wasn't compensated enough. I mean, and this thing got really too much to do with Nick. I mean, it's yeah. Nick Cannon presents, but you know he right. has bosses he got to answer to too. And we so, gonna definitely get into that a little bit more. Right, but yeah. but let me just say this to answer your question: I felt um, that that was the problem. That was me and Nick's problem because, like you say, it was business. But me and him were so personal that I didn't look at it as business no more. Like, nigga, just do it. Go do it, Nick. Like, mm -hmm. go tell them. Da -da 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 -da. Can't do it like that, Spank. I could tell it. Come on, nigga. You my brother, yeah. man. Come on. So so I think, and that could be my fault. That could be his fault. That could be whoever's fault. But I just took it like, fuck this business shit, bro. You yeah. my boy. Take care of me. Like everything I'm doing for this, I need you to take care of me. So right. I think he I think he did until he couldn't no more. Right. And then That's you fair. can instantly see it. As soon as he couldn't take care of me no more, you can see it. I can feel it easily. You know, that's got to be a, a, a balancing act, right? That's why they say, like, you don't want to get too personal in business because it starts getting a little, you know, kind of sticky. It's hard to really be your boy. But I got these bills at the house. I got these kids, AK, you know, <laughs> i.e. Nick Cannon, I gotta take care of. I can't really play this rebel game. I have to make sure I like keep keep my, my family intact. Now my question for you from your vantage point, Cat Wins will leave around season three or the end of season three while and out. Do you know why he left or do you have a reason or why you think he left? I think he wanted uh, more points. I think he wanted to be paid more, even more than we were getting paid. And this, and you're talking about a time where mm -hmm. I was satisfied at this time, at the time you're talking, timeline you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I was very satisfied. So to see somebody want more, and I, and I can't say that's what it is, but that, I mean, yeah. you only could guess. Like, I think he just wanted more, like, because Cat was bringing a different energy because, again, he was already famous. Right. So he was the only person that was art. Nick was, you know, it's Nick, of course. Yeah, he's yeah. already famous. But out of the cast members, Cat was the only famous one. So he got yeah. to talk shit. He got all his clothes got brought to his dressing room. We had to go to the wardrobe. You know what right. I'm saying? Like it was a different thing, and everybody saw it, and we was all like, "What the fuck is that?" But then we yeah. all had to like humble ourselves and be like, "Okay, well, this is Cat Williams. He is helping us out," and. You know, and he brought a, a great dynamic to the show. I mean, nobody can argue that. I was going to say, like, when I was uh, a youngster watching Wild and Out, because I think y'all got about 20-something seasons in the in the bag right now. When I was a youngster watching it, I remember just anticipating um, Cat Williams' wild style. Every time you knew he was going to kill it, it was kind of like an and one mixtape where you knew he was going to throw the ball between his legs and off the backboard and dunk it home um, with Cat. Let me ask you this. Yes, sir. Who do you think they used to sacrifice for his raps every week? For think the punchline. Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you was a team player, I guess, at that point, right? Of course. I'm a point guard. Because I remember your shirt coming off at one point and just like... I'm just going to let y'all have it. I don't I don't care. But yeah. Right. Because I had to take a lot of sacrifices, man. If I wasn't didn't have a street cred or people didn't know me by comedy, that could have hurt me. How did you um, how did how do you guys approach that? Just for people that want to get an insight. Is there a conversation that, hey, Spanky, you're going to be kind of the fall guy? Did you talk to Kat about that? How did that or did it just kind of take place and you just peeped game? And kind of went with the flow. Well, you kind of got to go with the flow, but 
if if somebody fucks with you, like like say we're on the set right now, I go up to you and say, "Hey, John, write something mm -hmm. for me because this is what I might say about you. this. Is what I might say to you, I might say gotcha. this. If if like, if I get in a crunch, I'm gonna go to you and say this. So write gotcha. something for me so you could so I won't just be dogging you out and leaving you out there. Gotcha. So you know, so that that all uh, depended on the respect of the comedian that you were working with. You know what gotcha. I'm saying? And, yeah, but Cat never did that. He would just say, um, beware, Spanky. I'm coming after you today. I'd be like, oh, okay. All right, Cat, let's do it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and, and that was some of the best battles, me and Cat. So I don't, I don't, I didn't never mind losing them or winning them. I didn't care. Yeah. Because I yeah. knew if Cat was talking to me, I was definitely going to get some air time. So speaking of battles, right, let's go back to the Shannon Sharp interview. Um, which was a huge battle. Cat would mention a few names. Like I mentioned, Kevin Hart was one. We talked about their beef just now. But Cedric the Entertainer got some some bullets right at him. Um, he didn't hold back. Like a lot of times when I see Cedric, people kind of like Cedric. He's kind of like, you know, um, respectfully jolly and kind of like happy-go-lucky and, you know, got a warmth about himself. But Cat um, clearly doesn't see him in that light. Did you notice anything? Because because Cedric was on the earlier, um, some earlier episodes or er, earlier episode of Wild and Out. Did you notice any tension back then um, with Cat and Cedric? I remember Cat staying in his dressing room on some episodes until it was time to shoot. So I always wondered why we was doing that, and then I. But now later on, we learned that. Oh, he really didn't like these people. See, I, I mean, it's a lot of people that I don't like because it's competition. But right. Cat didn't like them personally. He didn't like them professionally or he didn't like them personally. So, uh, so like for me, said the entertainer is a, a good guy. I mean, you know, but the internet don't lie. The receipts don't lie. I mean, yeah. I think he's a great guy, but the internet thinks He's a joke thief. So you saw the, did you see the play by play? The two jokes? Joke? I remember when they both were doing that joke and they both with, I remember um, said coming to, I think it was the Laugh Factory and Kat said, yeah. I'm, when are you going to stop doing my joke? Really? So you seen Kat confront him? Yeah. About this. Of okay. course. Of course. Wow. And I remember it said like, being said, classy said, just kind of brushing it off. Oh, come on, man. It's a joke we're talking about. But Cat was running around in a circle, like mad as hell. But but said was more like, uh, you know, I've done that already. He was like, yeah, yeah. because you got it from me. Like, uh, whatever. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But, but said, it, said is know. cool. Said is all yeah. right, man. He, I, I just, to be to be fair with uh, what Cat said, and I had to research this after I watched it because he was saying that uh, said stand-ups weren't that great. And I, and I quickly remembered, I don't remember any stand-ups stand from said. So they can't be that great. And I'm not saying nothing about said the entertainer. Said the entertainer right. from St. Louis, them some real niggas out there. So I'm not I'm not questioning him or his or his profession. I was just clearly doing the math after I heard Kat say, you have four episodes, four of them, and no one likes them. And I was like, do it? You got four? So I had to find right. them. They're hard to find. They're they're kind of pushed under the rug in a sense. Yeah. So Kat did said something brilliant again. He brought he turned the light on. He turned the light switch on on that. Like and then how he said said as an entertainer, but he don't dance, he don't sing, he don't do this, he don't do that. It's like, damn. It's like, I guess you're right. And yeah. again, nothing against said the entertainer. He always showed me love. He never took yeah. me on the road. I never worked with him. I never, nothing right, like that. Right. Just only seen him in comedy clubs and admired him. I admire him because he's way before me. He's like an uncle in comedy to me. So you don't diss your uncle unless you catch him smoking crack or something. So, right. you know, I can't diss, I can't diss him because he's way beyond me. So, but I will say I see things. I have eyes. Uh, and the internet believes Cat. Right. I guess what is, uh, what is the, um, you know, it seems like Cat confronting Cedric is part of the protocol. If someone steals a joke, you have the opportunity to address the situation. And I've heard that if someone's confronted, like say like you accuse me of stealing your joke, 
if I was a one, I shouldn't be stealing your joke, first of all, that's a violation. But if I do get caught in the act, a way for me to clean that up is that I would break you off some bread for the joke, like compensate you. Is that the way that, is there something else that a comedian can do to kind of make things right if someone takes a joke from them? Or yeah, or they take someone's joke. Let me drop some knowledge on you. Rest in peace, uh, Robin Williams is, and because this is the first comedian I ever seen do this. He would sit in the audience, and if you said something that he liked, he would write a check and walk up to you like, you know that joke you just said about Obama uh, here. And wow, to me, that's the proper way to do it. If you're gonna steal jokes, and that's still stealing, by the way, that's, that's still stealing. Still stealing. <laughs> but he paid for it. You know, that's yeah. like going to Walmart, getting caught stealing, and then you say, but I got the money right here. That's still that's stealing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, if you got the cash, why you steal? Well, I, I like right. the excitement. But so it's like, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're going to steal a person's joke, man, you, you have to pay them. But I, I just want you to know this. In the comedy world, that's not respected. Only yeah. reason why I was respected because Robin Williams is white. Mm. And he was already Mork for Mork. He was already all of these guys. So it's like, oh, uh, you want my joke? It's more of an honor thing with Robin. With mm. with with uh said stealing a, a Spanky A's joke or a Cat Williams joke, that's not honor because we're all black, we all struggling, we all in LA, none of us live here, none of us are from here, we all in a forbidden land. Why would you take the meat I just hunted right now? Why would you do that to me? Well, just mm. bring your family and sit down and we're gonna all eat, but don't take the, the shit when I go hunt some more. So it's just hunters, we all hunters. So if you take my prize that I, kill, I shot and killed and you eat it, then I'm not happy about that. Nobody would be happy about that. Now, Spanky, you know, this isn't the first time we've talked, especially I think you've been on our platform a few times. So some of the conversation is like highlighting key things um, related to the cat, you know, um, as far as interview. But also I want to kind of go into the origin um, of like what you've what you've done in the past. Some people don't know, you know, and I'm going to ask you straight up. I've never asked you this straight up before. Um, has was Wildin' Out stolen from you? Yes. Yes. It was stolen from a group. And you can Google. This is all Googleable. Uh the we were called the other level. Uh it was myself, Joe Blunt, Howie Bell, and Thomas Ward, and Tony Roberts would come in and out because he was a working comic at the time. So he he didn't have the time to commit to us to stay there to make it. Uh, we did, uh, what was that called? The Aspen, HBO Aspen Comedy Festival in 2000. Mm. So remember, Wild and Out didn't come out to 2005. Okay. So we already had a deal for that show. We are, we are Then they pushed us to Motown Live, which was a show that was shot in L.A. Montel Jordan was the host. You know, they put us on that show right. just to hold, right. you know, just to give us a little work. So... It's things that I could point out in history that will let you see for yourself that, oh, yeah, they was kind of doing this before that. So right. Nick got the deal and, and just hired me. So I have four, three, three to four other guys that I always had to report to. And I had to let them stay with me because we in L.A. and we all homeless. So I'm the only one with money. So that's why I, the experience of it, I didn't really cherish it because I felt like I never got a chance to like do it myself. It was always somebody I had to do something for. Oh, you hungry or you need this or you need that or you need mm. I'm working for like grown people. And it's not their fault. It's the industry. Like it's the it, that taught me that no matter who made what up, if a motherfucker wanted it, they just gonna steal it. For sure. Now you so I'm gonna I'm gonna run it back just so I can clearly understand what you put down. There was a comedy group that you were part of, and you guys were doing a um, somewhat a variation of what we now know as Wildin' Out, like sketches, improv, rap. Yeah, we rapped, the we whole did sketches nine. and stand up in the middle. Okay, uh, it was exactly like Wildin' Out. Here's another thing, here's, and I don't want to jump too far, but here's another mm -hmm. uh, very 
Good point. When I quit Wild and Out, mm-hmm. I complained to Nick and said, listen, if I'm not going to be on this show, you can't do the show that I brought to you. You got to mm-hmm. change this show some kind of way. Mm-hmm. All then conceded came. Okay. Then Hitman Holla came. Gotcha. Then Justina, Justina and Valentine. So they had to change it to a rap show because it wasn't. And then here's another fun fact. I brought Smack from Smack DVD to Wildin' Out. I invited him to Wildin' Out. So he met Nick, and that was the connection. See, I was making the connections even when I was trying to leave. I was Because I was the only quote-unquote street guy or 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 let's just, a better way to say that is I grew up in New York. So when we was filming mm-hmm. in New York, my whole family was there. My grandmother sat next to Nick Cannon mom. So you know what I'm saying? So it's like they 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 was trying to like they thought that I was running it in LA, but when they when we went to New York, I ran it even harder because I was I grew up there. So they they could they were trying to find ways to just cut me out. Like after right. a while. They okay, so Emmanuel, because I, I and I'm saying Emmanuel because this actually happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, his first time ever, he was scared, he was kind of nervous because we were all like rock stars and he was just like a new guy. So he right. wrote this big ass paragraph to diss me, right? So he did this big ass paragraph, and whatever I said, they didn't show it, they just showed me walking away from him. Then the next episode. They show somebody getting at me, and then they would show me walking away. Like, they stopped letting me talk. They stopped letting me rebuttal. So that was one of the first things I was really angry about. Because I was like, how are you going to let these new motherfuckers dog the man? They got to make the new yeah, they gotta make the new people look like the man and phase you out. Now, I had asked originally, just to make sure I'm following the timeline, the comedy group, you have the comedy group. You guys are doing a variation or exactly like Wild and Out was known to become. In that, you get a deal. The deal then kind of holds your group group kind of like onto the side. Nick Cannon then gets a deal with, I'm guessing now, MTV or Viacom of some sort. And then he, then what happens is he coming to you and saying, hey, I like what y'all are doing, but I can just bring you into this. Well, okay, so let me paint the picture for you. Uh, we both had a deal with Will Smith over Brooks, uh, over Book Production. Uh, our deal fell out. Nick deals fell out. Nick had a personal relationship with Will. So that's what kept him around. So either Will said, hey, you should take their idea. Or Nick said, I'm going to do their idea, but I'm just going to take him. Mm-hmm. So he was filming uh, Roll Bounce in Chicago. And I had just be, happened to be in Detroit. So he flies me to Chicago and shows me this blueprint of things. And I'm like, uh, that's what we do. And he was like, yeah, that's what I want to talk to you about. So look, we're going to do the show that y'all do, but me and you going to do it. I said, but what about them? He was like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But I know you got a job, but stop worrying about them. You got the job. Wow. I'm like, oh my God. So it's like, that didn't set well, man. That's a sticky situation, I, I could imagine, right? It killed relationships, John. It killed it. You know, money kills everything. So yeah. so imagine being dirt poor and we all sharing an extra large french fry and all of a sudden now you you got, you you got know, all the money. $2.5 yeah. million dollars and I still don't have nothing. So we all looking at you like, oh, come on, man, give me this. Buy me some gym shoes. Nah, man, everybody daddy. So it's like, oh. Yeah. So, you know, but but to be honest, that's why I still have my chops in this business, because when I had my money, I shared it with people that I came up with. Right. And hopes and hopes that they would get a break. Yeah. Now, you never now you never broke me off any money, (laughs) but I can tell I can tell that about you, Spanky, like. You know, you seem very, very genuine. You don't meet a lot of people like that. So I can definitely see you being someone that's like, if you, if I got it, then y'all got it. Then, you know, we all got it kind of mentality. Now, I want to kind of push this along. Um, in the in the world of, of thievery, has anyone taken something from you 
And is there like a backstory to like actually your name, Spanky? Has someone ever kind of played with that at all? I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, that's another reason why I'm going to sock Kevin Hart in the face when I see him. Uh, he he literally tried to erase me. Uh, sometimes I feel like Nick Cannon had his hand on it. Well, not not enough to say, don't do it. It was just like, let me see what y'all go. I, like, and not to get off subject, I, I believe OJ didn't kill uh, Nicole, but I believe okay. OJ is so sinister and so gangster and he wants to be the boss that he wanted to see it. Not not so much that he wow. did it, but I think he wanted to see it. Just like when he got arrested out here in Vegas, he didn't have to go to the hotel room, to do but it, he right. wanted to see it. So I say that to say... That's an interesting point. Right. So, so I, I say that to say, Kevin Hart out of nowhere brings this whack-ass nigga named Spank that don't even look like a Spank, that just name is Spank. Where the fuck did you get your name from? Uh, when I first met him, we was about to fight in New York because I said, hey, my name's wow. Spanky Hayes. He said, I know who you are. My name's Spank Horton. And I was like, what? I thought he was joking. Right. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. So Kevin Hart even tried to create another Spanky. Well, did you ever like bring this to Kevin's attention? What if he's not thinking about that? Did you ever, for a fact, bring it to him yet? Whenever I'm anywhere that Kevin Hart is, he leaves right away. He doesn't want to have a conversation with me because I've threatened him so many times. Like, bro, I'm going to beat your ass. Like, you should see DMs that I've left Kevin Hart. Like, bro, I'm going to beat the dog shit out of you when I see you, bro. Like, you stole, Kevin Hart stole so many of my jokes. Let me. Okay. I was going to ask you what makes you want to to actually have to phys get physical with Kevin Hart. Let me tell you something. One time my mother called me. And, you know, my mother's like 76. So, you know, she probably in the bed listening. She's not looking. Mm -hmm. So she calls me and says, why didn't you tell me you was going to be on TV today? And I said, well, you know, we never know what, what Wild and Out is going to come on. She said, no, this ain't Wild and Out. You're doing comedy. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm doing comedy? She said, yeah. And I said, I don't know if that's me, Mom. So she said, okay, well, let me watch it, and I'll call you back. And then she calls me back 30 minutes later and says, do you know Kevin Hart? And I said, yeah. She said, that motherfucker sound just like you. Mm. And I was like, I know, Mom, I write jokes for him. And my mom said, stop writing jokes for people because they, they, they don't sound funny. They sound like you. Mm. And though, to her son, you know, I'm probably never funny to her. You know, <laughs> I'm just probably a dumbass nigga that she has yeah, to take yeah. care of. So it's like, mm. so it's like, it's like it, it got personal. If it, it was beyond business. It got personal. He started dressing like me. He started, I, I mean, if you ask anybody else, they'll probably tell you the same thing. Like, I, I have a blueprint of comedy because I always looked at comedy as a battle rapper. Like, a, not so much as Richard Pryor because I, I felt like I couldn't do what Richard Pryor do. Like, he's a genius. Nobody can do that. So it's like, Eddie Murphy, nobody can do that. Nobody's done it yet. So it's like, you know, so it's like, and then this motherfucker just comes out of nowhere stealing everybody's shit. So it's like, huh? Like, what are you, man? You should, man, you're going to die. I've, I've told Kevin Hart before, man, somebody going to seriously hurt you, bro. Like, somebody going to hurt you, my nigga. Like, for real. Well, what do you mean? Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, 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 nigga, you just, you're a thief. And, and that's why I say Nick sometimes probably had his hand on it because Nick dealt with Kevin a lot. So he right. know me. They so he know really that good. he's getting that from me. So that that's that's my beef with the industry. Like, how can you take something from a motherfucker and don't like 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 Cat, uh, Cat Williams said this? He said, "Uh, it, it's about money." He was talking about Melba Moore. He was like, "So you mean to tell me if you don't got enough money for your flowers, you don't get them?" That's profound because I feel that way. Like. No, they never gave me flowers. I have to take their flowers because they were mine anyway. Just like that all deaf digital shit, all of these little comedians that come up from no, do you know their whole blueprint is wilding out? They want to be like wilding out. So that means that they're looking at me. So Spanky, this is this is a great part of the conversation. 
because we do all kind of interviews, right? And I've done all kind of stories. Why do the ones in your position end up in your position? Like, why do we see like a guy like, let's say Kevin did take these things and you see him climb up? And why are the, there's the guys that's the real sauce, they're left behind? What is that difference? Because the guy with the real sauce kind of knows that, well, you could riff like me, you could play like me, but you don't got it like me. You got to watch me. So it's kind of like a, a false, some false feeling because you feel like, well, they're not better than me. So you let them do their thing. Because I was going to say the, the guy with the real sauce never ends up being the more successful one. It never, it never is. David Banks wrote for Richard Pryor. And you, if you know who David Banks is, then you know comedy. But a lot of people don't know who David Banks is. A lot of people think that Paul Mooney wrote a lot of stuff for Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. But they, and, and, and to be honest, none of them really wrote for Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor would go on rants and forget what he's saying. And those two guys would be writing down what he's saying. So is that called writing for you or is that called remembering what you said? Either way, yeah. I got to love you or I got to be depend depending on you to even want to take that position. Because you got to remember, they're all comedians, and 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 I'm sure they all feel like I'm just as good as you. Yeah. So it's now just about imagine. taking taking a role, and a lot of people don't take roles. And I didn't I didn't accept my second role because I'm used to being Stephen Curry. So now you're gonna tell me I'm not Stephen Curry. I'm Draymond Green. Uh huh. What do you mean yeah. by that? So it's like. No, man, I'm set. I'm the one who brings the ball up. And and then you can see the quality of, of the thing after I stopped bringing the ball up. You see, they tried to let Corey. And, and, and I'm saying names, but I'm not dissing. Corey Holcomb is a cousin of mine. D-Ray is a cousin of mine. Detroit comedians and Chicago comedians call themselves cousins. Because most times, if I'm from Detroit, Chicago is probably my first road gig ever. And like the Chicago, Detroit is probably their first road gig, Ohio or something like that. So we all call each other family because we all had to eat together. You know what I mean? Exactly. So I'm not saying these names in no kind of vein. I love Corey Holcomb. I love, you know, 5150 show. I love all that shit. D-Ray is mm -hmm. like my real, real family. But I'm saying all that to say it's so competitive that if your mama start doing comedy, you might start hating on her because she's funny and she's going to be funnier than you and people going to see where you got your funniness from. And that's the whole thing is the mask. Everybody want to put on a mask and don't want to let nobody see their emotions. But, you know, just like any hero with a mask, as soon as you catch them, what's the first thing you do? Take your mask off. See who they are. You know what I'm saying? And that's the thing with show business. Nobody wants to really be who they are. They'd rather just steal and emulate and get to the ladder and then look at the person and be like, oh, I stole his joke already. And oh, he's nothing. So this, this is like a garbage industry. Like if you're not the garbage man, you're the garbage. Wow. So and you have to figure out which one you are. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. And it's pretty was, garbage um... too. It's pretty garbage too. No, that's a deep, deep way of looking at it from that um, that perspective. You know, I think it, it seems to be a combination in which people do become successful in the business. Because I, I don't want to discredit as if like Kevin has nothing going for him. There's clearly some things that he is, there's something he's doing right, right? There's something he's doing right. Yeah. Right. Whatever he did to pray, however he was praying to put himself right there, in that position, mm -hmm. I will never be mad at God for any decision he makes. But yeah. and another thing Kat said, that, but I, well, I will say this before I say that, but I don't think mm -hmm. that's God. I think that's the devil. And like, and, and mm -hmm. like Kat said, the devil can promise you all this shit, but he can't bless you. He can't give you shit. He, it's your first initial deal. And if you look at it that way, that's show business. They're gonna give, they're not gonna give you more than you asked for. 
You know what I'm saying? Every deal is different. You could come in, let's just say Master P. Again, I'm just throwing names out there. Yeah, just yeah, say yeah. we're doing a production with Master P. And I've seen him do this. He'll call you in first and y'all negotiate whatever y'all negotiate. He pays you whatever you ask for. And then he's going to call me in. I could ask for triple the amount that you asked for. But that's what I asked for. So it's about, it's about looking a motherfucker in their face and asking mm -hmm. them or telling them what you need and what you can sell it for. And don't go beyond that. Don't If you're standing on a square, don't get off the square. Because as soon as you get off the square, they're going to put somebody right there and say, well, he wanted less, uh, $100,000 less than he wanted. So, yeah, let's go. Speaking of Kat's interview, because, again, he mentioned a lot of different people, but there was also people he didn't mention um, that I thought, you know, was was credible, right? That says a, a lot about some folks. Um, I don't think Eddie Griffin got called out or disrespected. Um, he loves Eddie know, Griffin. He he calls Eddie know, Griffin the guru. I can see that. And you're 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 related to, uh, or you have a relationship with Eddie, I, I think as well, right? I, I talk to him once a week, at least once a week. Got you. And then the other, but there's the other name that came up that I thought was interesting because. You, um, Eddie's connected to him, but you seem to be on the other side of it. I mean, you connected to all these folks, which is why it was great to talk to you about it, uh, was Mike Epps. Mike Epps didn't get mentioned either. But Spanky, I have I did my YouTube searching, I did my Googling. You had some tension or have some tension with Epps. Um, how, did that, how did that beef start between you and Mike Epps out of all people? Well, first of all, let me say this. I'm a grown man now. Uh, things, a lot of things in my life has changed me. Uh, I believe in God way more than I ever did in my life. So I forgive Mike Epps, but Mike Epps used to sleep on my couch, bro. I talked him to move to LA. He lived with me. I had a girlfriend at the time and she hated him because she, he wouldn't do nothing, but I'm not going to throw him under the bus like that. But I will say he was unruly, very unruly. Uh, he felt like he was owed something. So, and then mm. when he got Friday, and and then by the way, Ice Cube paid for me to get in SAG, so I knew Ice Cube that yeah. way, right? Yeah. Because of Players Club, he wanted me to play AJ Johnson's role in Players Club. He just kept complaining that I was too young, but I was like, but that's what's gonna make it funny because I'm gonna be talking like a grown guy. So I kind of convinced him to at that least let funny, me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but and that ended up ended up working for AJ Johnson. Rest in peace, AJ Johnson. And um, but so in that time, he paid for my sag. So let's move on a little bit later. Mike Epps can, comes. He's the new guy in town. He's saying the newer jokes because nobody knows him, or they know him from TV, but they never have seen him. And mm -hmm. then, and then Ice Cube gives him a deal. Gives him the, the movie next Friday. I remember him sleeping on my couch with three scripts. He had next Friday or whatever Friday that was, date and all about the Benjamins. And I was thinking, he got a three-picture deal in six months. Again, that's some Kevin Hart shit. That never happens. That never happens. So as soon as he got his thing, he moved out, of course. I didn't talk to him for months. So he just disowned me. So then I talked to Cube and he was like, I got a movie. I got a little small role for you in this movie. To my knowledge, Mike Epps went to uh, to Ice Cube and said, man, don't let Spanky in this movie, man. This is my movie. Let me just be the only one doing it. I don't want none of my friends in it. I just want me. And how I know this is because Ice Cube came up to me and said, man, you cost me a lot of money. And I was like, how? He was like, I had to pay... Uh, Rappaport, what's his name? Michael Rappaport. Yeah. Three times the amount that I was going to pay you. And I was like, what you mean? Because the movie hasn't come out yet. So I don't even know what he's talking about. So right. then later I see Michael Rappaport in the movie and I'm like, oh, that was supposed to be my part. But Mike Epps like shitted on me. So mm -hmm. once Mike Epps got a little fame, he starts shitting on everybody. So we start fighting. And uh, another one of my cast members, uh, Thomas Ward, socked him out. Um, he had this dude named Johnny uh, Jimmy Martinez that we ended up being like this. Come, mm -hmm. He flew him out to L.A. to fight us because we knew that we didn't know him. So where's this big-ass nigga coming from swinging on us? 
So it, it's a lot of catty bullshit in this game, especially when you get money. Because like yeah. you, once you get money, you want to punish niggas. Like I want to be the freshest nigga. I want to have bodyguards. Anybody come around me, I want to smush their face. All that. <laughs> so Mike Epps turned yeah. to a, a fucking diva right in yeah. front of my eyes, and I couldn't believe it. Like, bro, you. It got beyond of you ain't gonna help me out. I mean, after how many times can you ask a nigga to help you out? So it's right. like I asked him the the you know legitimate five times. Let's say five times. I right. asked him, "Come on, Mike, man, look out for me, man. I looked out for you. You stayed on my car. You ain't have to pay shit for six months. They could just throw Come me on. a ball. You know what I'm saying? But this is how I knew that he didn't look at me and respect me the same way because we would buy each other gyms. Okay, again. Uh, Mike Epps was the working comedian out of both of us. So he would, mm -hmm. it was a lot of weekends he would leave and he would come back Monday or Tuesday. He would come back with some gym shoes. Oh man, thanks. Da, da, da. So now I get a deal and I, and Mike don't live with me no more. So I go to Mike's house nine o'clock in the morning, front, straight from the airport. This before Uber or any of that. I caught a cab over there. Mm -hmm. And I had these blue and white fours uh jordan fours and they were blue they're white with the blue on it and i get I, I said here bro you always look out for me here you go and this nigga said buy me gym shoes man would i look like a little bitch or something and i was like huh oh so i'm a bitch come outside i'm not gonna beat you up in your house come outside nigga mm. my guy was trying to stab me in atlanta i remember i remember Doing a uh, some shit. Uh, it was called Laugh a Palooza. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know Atlanta that well, but I remember it was the downtown mall, and y'all had like a food court, and it had like a Chick Fil A because where we both fell at was in front of Chick Fil A. You said it's downtown, downtown, like I, I think it was two, called like the Underground. Or the something Underground, like that. yeah, it's called the Underground. Oh, That's right. There we go. So. I'm talking to comedians and I'm walking and then I started noticing there was less and less comedians walking with me. And then I hear somebody say, why are you doing this, Mike? You, you in movies. And then I look and this motherfucker got a knife and he, he's, he's doing the knife like this, like old school. Like, stop yeah, it, stop like, it, stop yeah it. motherfucker, I'm about to get your ass. I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God. And I should, and this sounds this is not funny, but it's the way you're doing it making it quite humorous. I mean, it's funny now, but at the time, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? But <laughs> and he was all coked out and all fucked up. And mm -hmm. I mean, you can, I, man, you can ask anybody I, that. You can ask anybody that. Ask, ask was, Ali, uh, Ali that from Houston. He was standing right next to me. Ali Sadiq is who you're talking about. Now, now, um, you mentioned this now before we got into like as we got into Mike, you said I forgive him now. Yeah, I forgive him now. What 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 made you get to that point in terms of, you know, just you let it kind of roll off you? What what happened? Because I've adapted to being a regular guy again, which kind of makes me dangerous too. Uh so I've learned that, you know. You're going to be broke sometimes. You ain't going to have what you want all the time. This, uh, at, after I stepped out of the industry, I could see it better. I get, I, like they say, you can't see what's swimming around you if you're in the, in the fish tank. You yeah. got to get outside the fish tank to see the yeah. other fish. So I couldn't see all of these things happening. And then I'm trying to better myself every day and, you know, trying to make it be a star and all that. So it's a lot of shit I can't pay attention to because it's going to slow me down. So, but... I, it just hurts to know that somebody that you would break a uh, half a sandwich to just give because you know this nigga hungry too, and then you see him with a big giant table, thirty two foot sandwich, and the nigga don't give you a pickle off of it. That that's uh, that's pretty mind boggling. That's pretty mind boggling, man. So I just felt real bad. All my friends, all my street friends, all everybody because. It's kind of like how Isaiah Thomas talks about Michael Jordan. How he said he ain't better than me. I beat, I mm -hmm. beat him. I, be, I showed him around Chicago. I'm the one who did it. Right. Dude. So that's what it was. He came to me, slept on my couch, 
I took them to the comedy store, to the improv, to the. I showed them around LA. I introduced them to the people that he might still call friends or whatever. I introduced them to the guy. Okay, so it's a the character that Day Day is with the thing on his head and the t shirt. That was a guy. That was a person that both of us knew that got killed, that, that used to dress like that every day. Wow. So when he started doing the movie, he dressed like that in memory to him. So people wouldn't even know that if you wasn't there. Right. So so me and Mike was like this, bro. It, it really broke my heart because I thought he was yeah. a real friend. Yeah. So I again, can that's bringing business personal in the business. So that's two yeah. times I did that. So I'm not scared to admit when I'm wrong. So yeah. that's two times that I did that. I think that's, you know, the heart of a, a, a lot of this. It's a balancing act of, you know, how do you be personal, but at the same time, not get burned by overextending yourself and then also creating false expectations on what you would hope a friend would do. Um, it's dope to see what Mike has kind of uh, matured into in recent days and recent time. You know, he's um, flipping homes back in his hometown of Indiana uh, and remodeling. And it seems like he's, you know, from my vantage point is that maybe old Mike has kind of went away and that there's now a new, more mature, grown Mike because, you know, respectfully, Sphinx, I don't know your age, but y'all y'all putting in some time, you know? Y'all not like just youngins running around, you know? Now, the the part of why I was also excited, because clearly I knew you had these stories. So like, yes, let's definitely do an interview with Spanky because Spanky got stories. You was kind of, to, to be real, before Cat got out the bag, <laughs> case in point, you was kind of, you was on this same wavelength. So I was like, you know, this could be like a part two. This is Spanky Unleashed. Now, let me tell you why, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one of my favorite platforms. Uh, and let me tell you why. Because let me tell you why that didn't work in my favor like it worked for theirs. Because my heart mm -hmm. was in it. They mm -hmm. Their hearts weren't in it. They're just rebuttaling. Uh, trying to say the toughest thing, like trying to say the funniest thing. But I come from the heart. So it's like, right. you know, a, a lot of my stories might be the same because they all really happen. Like, I'm not capping about this. Like, this is really my life. So again, but Mike Epps, I, I definitely, I would love to talk to him. Uh, he need to mm. give me one of the motherfucking houses, nigga. Maybe I can flip houses in Detroit. Because Detroit, I know Detroit could use that that type of love, especially in our communities. Maybe that could be a good opportunity there. Um, y'all using y'all platforms for, for something like that. But then, listen, how about this? Let me just share some light on this. But how about this, though? You could look at it as a devious way, too, because Mike's not from Detroit. Well, Mike, Mike just opened a comedy club in Detroit. Mike just did a couple of things. But you're not from Detroit. You know I'm from Detroit. So what are you doing? The shit I can't do? So I, that's what I'm saying. So it depends on how I wake up in the morning, how I look at shit. I think y'all gotta, I think, I think, I think y'all gotta, I think y'all gotta talk about it. I think y'all gotta, y'all gotta have that one-on-one. -on -one. I think of me and Mike, only way we would talk, if it's no way, no person, people around me, and there's no people around him. If there's people yeah. around him, and there's people around, we're gonna fight. Every time. Ego, and by the way, ego. me and Mike Epps, have been fighting each other for about close to 30 years. You're not tired yet? When he see me, he leave. See, I, I run the comedy store. I am I had my name on the wall on 2000. Nobody, only Eddie Griffin, Paul Mooney, and all of them was working there. I was like the only young comic there. So I own that. I run that shit. So it's like whenever they have black nights, that's when you might see a Mike Epps or a Seth Entertainer or or a, or a uh, right. Ricky Smiley or something like that. But in, but the next day you won't. But I'm there, mm. so it's like yeah. So it's like certain people you come in. It's like you. I can't come in if I got beef with you and me and you about to straighten it up. I wouldn't say I'm coming to your house to talk to you because you can shoot me in your house if you got mad enough. So I would say, let, let's go to a neutral spot, which mm -hmm. mostly is the comedy store. But unfortunately, is my house still. So you got to feel where I'm coming from. You got to listen to me. And if you don't feel like that or your friends is 
egging you on to do other shit, it's not going to end up right. So no. I don't think me and Mike would probably ever talk. And if it, if we did, it would probably be like on an airport and we sit next to each other and we don't have nothing to do with this. We didn't plan this. And You never know because, um, you know, Ricky Smiley ended his beef with Arnaz J during that same, with that same type of scenario where they both end up sitting together on a flight and end up kind of like squashing whatever they had going on. Now, to kind of end the beef conversation, and I'm sure you got a few more or a couple, <laughs> but like, uh, did you, um, you and Little Duval, did y'all ever get to that, to that, to that point where you can kind of forgive him? And I don't even know what was the origin of you guys having your fallout. Um, Cause you guys will work together in um, school dance. You worked to, with the, all of those folks. Now let me let me tell you about that the school dance. So okay, so by the time we were shooting school dance, me and Lil Duval was in a full fledged Twitter beef. So we were both going back and forth with each other, talking shit, not thinking that we would ever run into each other, right? Mm -hmm. So I did some stupid shit. I let my friends smoke some weed in my trailer. They kicked me out of my trailer, but I didn't know that. So I would go to work the next morning, and I knock on the door, and fucking little Duval answers the door. Okay. I was like, Merry Christmas. Come outside, nigga. I'm mad to you. You got my trailer? Oh, I'm about to beat your ass. So my friend, a mutual friend, well, he was really my friend, Kool-Aid. His name was Kool-Aid. Rest in peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a Detroit yeah. comedian uh, yeah. who actually wrote uh, Living My Best Life, who actually would say every day, nigga, I'm living my... Because he had cancer. He had full-blown cancer. So whenever you would ask Kool-Aid, man, how you doing? He would say, nigga, I'm living my best life. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And his thing would be, because he would be the host of a lot of comedy clubs, he'd be like, who going first? I'm not back. I'm not going back and forth with y'all niggas. Like, but who going first? So this is Kool-Aid mm. talking to me in this song. I don't even hear Lil Duval. I only hear Kool-Aid. Mm. So, and then I understand uh, he took Kool-Aid on a roll at, uh, you know, near his death. He was a big Dallas Cowboy fan, so he would take him on a roll wherever to the city that they uh, they would Dallas would be playing in that week. Right. He would take him, you know. So, so we kind of tried to take care of him a little bit at the end of his life. So because of that, I let all of the beef go with Lil Duval. Wow, because he took care of my boy Kool Aid. But again, I felt like they were doing it because I didn't do it, and maybe just because I'm the only child and I'm a fucking asshole and maybe I just think everybody pointing fingers at me but that's just how I felt like oh you right. helping my boy out so that means y'all having conversations about me it gotta come back to me some kind of way that's what I was thinking and I remember one time Kool-Aid called me with Lil Duval on the phone it was like, y'all need to stop this shit, bro. Y'all need to stop going back and forth. And I remember Lil Duval trying to talking like T.I., saying all them big-ass words. He was just frustrating mm. the fuck out of me. And I was like, man, I'm going to beat your ass when I see now, you. I don't even want to talk to you no more. Now, Spanky, but, just... But God bless Lil Duval. I, I'm glad to hear that because, um, you know... I love the backstories because a lot of a lot of our viewers may not have never heard the, of these stories before. But I love that there's kind of like you know there's some like possibly some happy endings. Now I got a couple more questions for you, and um, you know because this has been I knew it was going to be like you know one that I would be interested to talk to you with. But as far as in 2005, you ended up doing the Bad Boys of Comedy, which is hosted by Diddy at that point. Um, he was doing a collaboration with Walter Lathan of the Kings of Comedy. Just because I know you're a rock star, this is not implying anything. You Have you been to one of these so-called Diddy parties? Because I know they're not all, I know they're not like just straight gay parties. They're just like a party and then there's activities that take place. Have you been to um, one of these parties and what did you witness? Well, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say, Woo! Did he? Of course he did. Mm. <laughs> he has the perfect name. Like, and then Diddy parties would be like this. And then if you think about, because we, I don't know how old you are, but I'm sure you somewhere in that age group that you were seeing what I was seeing. And Puffy had a party everywhere. 
every mm-hmm. major, if it was a Soul Train event, Puffy got a party there. If it's a Vibe Award, Puffy got a party there. So Puffy had the parties, bro. He had the dopest party. If you didn't go to a Puffy party, you weren't there. You can't really talk about right. being there if you wasn't at Puffy's party. Now, did I see things? Yes. I've seen a lot of things. Um, I remember walking in a room trying to find a bathroom, and I can't say no names, and that's not like me because I love saying names. But uh, this is kind of a touchy subject, so I won't say the name. Uh, They were doing some pretty wild things. And I remember they had a fake hairline, and the hairline was sweated. And that's what I remember more than anything is the hairline being sweated. Like, what the fuck are they doing? So I immediately shut the door, went back out and tried to party. I couldn't get that off my head because I just seen some shit right then. And then I was like, I mean, I'm ready to go. And this was two men to be be particular two men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was it was one girl there, but she was her eyes were this big. So that means she wasn't participating. Correct. So she was looking at some shit. She wasn't sure if she should be seen. You remember do you remember the comedian? I think his name was um <sighs> I need to get it, remember his name. But there was a comedian that had a joke who said he noticed that men were turning gay because they were having so much sex. And then he was saying, like, I think he said this on the Bad Boys of Comedy. He's like, whatever that limit is, whatever that amount is, let me know. Like, so you won't go over it. And I man, I wish I remember the gentleman's name. You guys can put it in the comments if we um if we do remember it. But it makes me think, like, with Hollywood, you hear this thing of the this gay, gay parties and all that. But at what point, like, what is happening that's taking these seemingly heterosexual men, they get into this industry, and then, like, what is it? Is it because it's opening up different doors? Is it different gateways that is, like, things are being presented to you that you've never thought to entertain before? Why are brothers kind of getting into that type of space? like? I think I think it's and that's a great question, John. I think it's because if you if you are not controlling your soul, I don't think I think someone has a more control on you, and they guide you to these things, and they you know they make it so like well you're doing good now, but if you come to this party, I'm pretty sure you'll get that three picture deal. Uh, if you yeah. go in that room back there, I'm pretty sure. You'll have what you, what you, you'll leave here happy. So it's like, it's just like things that if you don't have a soul, basically they don't have souls and they're give, they're doing anything to be a star. They're being anything to be the person that they dreamed about doing and they will do anything. At that point, God is not involved. So I think once you take God out of it, out of your life, ain't no telling mm-hmm. what you're going to end up doing. Could you just do something just to be part of the vibe or just to go with the flow and get the deal? Now, in conclusion, you mentioned earlier that you and Nick Cannon got a deal. That was your first deal in Hollywood was with Will Smith at his at his company. Were you surprised kind of in relation to what we just talked about that you heard this story about from allegedly from um, Will Smith's former assistant that said he caught Will and Dwayne Martin having some type of uh, sexual relationship? Well, let me say this. I cannot confirm that from myself because I have never seen that. I've yeah. always seen Will be upstanding gentleman, uh, a giver, uh, fucking hilarious. Uh, Will Smith is hilarious, if you didn't know that. Uh, in his regular tone of talking, he's fucking hilarious. Uh, I've heard that before, but of course the internet is undefeatable. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I, it wouldn't, <sighs> Will, I love you, but I wouldn't be surprised Yeah, because what we just talked about, uh, yeah. when you're in the pursuit of that, there's no telling, it's, you can't have boundaries. If you're in a pursuit of that, 
So That's I deep. won't say, I won't point my fingers at Will Smith. I won't point my fingers at Dwayne Martin. But I will say again, the internet is undefeatable and they bring out great points. A lot of people think that Orlando Brown is uh, retarded. But if you listen to him, he's mm-hmm. saying some shit. Mm-hmm. But they paint this picture of, put this mask, back to the mask, they put this mask on you so you, you're not believable. You look like yeah. a crackhead saying the realest shit you ever said in your life. But no one catches on to it because they already dirtied you up. So right. a person, a truth teller, I, I believe that Orlando Brown is a truth teller. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Well, you just said something that I thought was really profound because in listening to you today, I was trying to figure out like, okay, again, why are the guys that seem to have the talent or have the the sauce not being able to scale up and 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 take off like the guys who are maybe taking from or not the originators? And you kind of made me think, you said something just now about, you know, not having any boundaries that that seems to be kind of like what you need to be. You need to be moldable. You need to kind of go with everything. You need to not necessarily have maybe code, a code of ethics with yourself. You just down to do whatever. You down to kind of like, and it seems like maybe there is a um, a connection there. Now in conclusion, Spanky, going from Detroit to Hollywood, has this shift been, you know, has that been an easy one to transition? Because it seems like there's a Detroit still in you that will probably never be left, which is a realness, which is a down to earthness, which is, you know, a grit that I know Detroit is known for. But then you go to a place like Hollywood. How are you trying to transition? Are you trying to transition from that? Are you trying to maintain Detroit while you're in Hollywood? How do you view that to keep your identity what it is today? I think that uh, we, it takes a lot of prayer and it takes a lot of uh, side eye viewing. Because, you know, a lot of times, like they say, a vampire, if a vampire catch you looking, then he kind of got you under your, under the spell. So it's kind of the same way. It's like a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of vampires walking around. And if you get caught staring at them, you're one too. So it's like you have to, I, I, I blame my mom for that because my mom was so real. And she always would tell me stuff like, if you suck a dick one time, you might as well suck a million. Uh, if you let, you know, if you spend 18 hours with a, the same guy, that's your boyfriend. Uh, my mama would say, but in the joking ways, she would say that. But, but, but it stuck in my brain like, oh, but, but what she was really trying to say is just because you're the only child don't mean you got to have a hundred niggas around you all the time. You know what I'm saying? That was be her way of, of relaying that message. But back to your, your question, again, if you don't have a soul uh, and you're going to lose it right away because people, believe it or not, and here's this now, back to the, the all deaf digital shit, People are sucking dicks now for YouTube deals. So did this really get better or did it get worse? Like now it's not even an option for a black comic nowadays coming up in the game to be a movie star. And it's only running your own channel. It's only doing YouTube. It's only, I mean, and it's nothing bad about that. But what I'm saying is they lessen the bar, but for the same results. Like, there's no movie deals. There's no three-picture deals anymore. There's no none of that mm-hmm. anymore. There's no more comedy albums. There's no more this. But we have this YouTube, and you can get on YouTube, and I'll come on there, and I'll put this on there and make you big. And So it's like it's the same soup reheated with a smaller bowl. Like, you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I, and, and I'm not saying anything against YouTube. But what I'm saying is being at Lion Gates Films, Versus being at YouTube. That's a hell of a drop. Understood. So Um, it's like, it's less, it's less. He only has less to give you now, but people still want it. They want to do it. So they just do it. They they don't care about their soul. They don't care about their mama. They don't care about their firstborn. They don't care about, these are things that, that I've heard 
You have yeah. to sacrifice. Look at look in world history, how many people lost kids and blew up right after that. Um, I don't want to say her name because I, I don't know her, so I don't want to diss her like that. But Jennifer Hudson, she her whole family got killed. And then in the movie Chirac, she had to relive that. In the movie, her family died. So it's right. like, what? Like, yeah, I, I, I just don't get it, but I, I'll just say this, John. I've never been in a position where I felt like uh, I'd rather be a rock star than go to heaven. So that's mm. just, but that's just me. And almost nobody I know is, feels like a high feel. You know, uh, I believe if you're not going to heaven at the end of this, you, you're dead right now. Mm. You know, it's a quote in the Bible, either you walk with God or you're walking with the eternal death, meaning you're dead right now if you don't believe in God. And God mm. is not in Hollywood. Uh, That's real. Probably, That's you know what I mean? So if you look into being Hollywood, you have to be very godly. You got to be God-fearing. And the more you stay in Hollywood, the more j gigs you get, the more cash, the checks you cash, the less you depend on God. Because now you feel like you're the God, which is a devil trait. And you, you the checks have your name on it, not God. The checks have th your car. You got insurance is in your name, not God's. So after a while, you start taking God out Put in this bullshit to fill it up, and it's never going to work right. like that. Right. So, uh, so I feel like again, if you don't have a soul, and a lot of people don't, John, a lot of people that we named and talked about today don't have a soul. You just got to learn how to be an actor and act like you're that too for them to put you in. If they feel like you're going to bring a preacher and put crosses in your dressing room, then they're going to hire you. If they, if you got an advisor saying, listen, that's not good for your brand and that's not good and it's, the, the, he got a dashiki on and an African hat, they're not going to hire you no more. In this business, you have to be in with the devil. You have to know the devil songs. You have to know how they walk. You got to know what shirt he had on yesterday. You going to go buy that shirt that he had on yesterday. You have to be in, in you got to be with the devil to make it in this business. I, I believe I mean, anybody yeah. with a billion dollars worship the devil because I don't think in God's eyes, you need that much money to survive on earth. That's just my point. That's a deep perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Spanky, um, because I feel like we can keep going and, and, and definitely I think you hit a strong note in this particular part of the conversation. Um, you know, I wanted you here mainly because, one, we haven't talked to you in a while. And then, two, you know, I know you have the stories and I'm sure you have many more that we didn't get a chance to cover. Um, but I mainly wanted to, like, you know. Put, the, put put different stories out there, different experiences that you had, because again, comedy is not a joke. The entertainment game is not a joke. And I think sometimes we as everyday people just kind of like look at it from that lens. So um, um, I hope that people got some entertaining stories at the same time. What have you been up to? And how can we support you? Um, what are you currently um, working on? All right, now, I have an album coming out, a uh, comedy CD. I'm taking it back, old school uh, Red Fox days. Uh, it's called Comedy is Dead, actually. Mm. Uh, and I got that from Nas. Remember back in the day, maybe 10 yeah, years ago, it was dead. Hip Hop is Dead. Right. So I just kind of emulated that. Uh, and I felt, I felt that strongly. So that comes out January 31st, which is also my born day, January 31st. Uh, and I have um, just some internet movies coming out, some Tubi movies coming out. Me and uh, Boo Capone, if you're not familiar with Boo Capone, he's from the Roast Me uh, show, and Brent Taylor mm -hmm. from the Roast Me show. We have mm -hmm. a movie that we're uh, set to do in April. Uh, oh. I have, I'm still doing Crank 3. I'm just waiting on Justin to uh, get done with his other movies. Uh, you know, we working, we working, we working the God way, we working the God way. Now, can I give some shout outs if you don't mind? I want to shout out Tony Roberts, the best 
comedian working today, in my opinion, one of my best friends ever in life. I uh, love you to death. Uh, Cat Williams for being a truth teller and telling your truth and looking out for me and my family uh, when I needed it. Because when I retired, John, uh, a lot of people didn't come to my aid, uh, but Cat did. And so I'm going to always be grateful for that. Uh, I want to say Ricky Smiley, keep doing your thing. Uh, I think that was a uh, – and, and can I clear this up? Go ahead. Real, real yeah. fast. Um, when he said that he had Cat Williams' role, he, this was the thing. The Money Mike character wasn't a pimp character then. It was a crackhead, begging for money character, type dirty character. Everybody in the city of L.A. comedians auditioned for that. I, di I didn't, though. But a lot mm -hmm. of people I knew did. Uh, and then Cat, they went to the improv. They saw Cat performing. This is Cat had his shit all laid out. And they told him, come come audition tomorrow. So when mm -hmm. the Cat came in with three, four ladies, he had his hair whipped. He had it perfect. And he convinced them in his delivery, like, no, I can't be a bum. Listen to how I'm talking. Look how I dress. Look at the, my women. He got to be a pimp. And Ice Cube said, Bing. you're right. So uh, Ricky Smiley did definitely have the role of Money Mike. But that's wow. when he was a crackhead bum on the street. It okay. wasn't the pimp. When when Cat got to it, it just automatically became a pimp. Because Cat even was Cat even mentioned about um, there was supposed to be a rape scene, but Cube has denied that that there wasn't a rape scene that he did, he did right. And I think you know it's it's up to us to decipher what we believe and who we believe um, when it comes to that interview. Um, but yeah, that's I, I'm glad you cleared that up from from your perspective. What you saw went down, uh, but just overall against Spanky. You know, it's always a great pleasure talking to you. I'm gonna make sure that we again are, are able to support your upcoming projects. I know you have the CD coming out. Happy birthday! If I don't talk to you before then, um, and thank you for, and we can play it and review it. That'd be cool. Um, with that being said, man, thank you for calling in to the Comedy Hype News Show. Um, again, thank you for talking with us. Thank you, and I want to say one last thing. Bless all the children in the world. Bless all the real fathers in the world. And anybody that I've talked about today in a negative way, you deserved it. But I love you and God loves you. And I'm just going to be a different person. And I'm just going to change the whole narrative of all the negativity because it's not working. It puts you, it, negative people put you on a treadmill that goes nowhere, as we all know. So get off the treadmill, be positive, love your mother. Uh, and in and, and the Quran, it says Allah is at the bottom of all mother's feet. So that means you got to love and protect your mother. That's what God is at the bottom of her feet. Imagine that. So I love you, John. Comic hype, y'all the That's shit. Right, I will be back whenever y'all need me. Spanky Hayes, Carlos Hayes. Thank y'all.